Hello, today is Monday, June 15th, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? Well, I want to welcome you all to the show, and we have a great show for you today. We are very fortunate to have Egyptologist Dr. Carmen Bolter with us today. I'll tell you, this weather out here is just a little bit crazy. Um, where we are in New York, I usually give you guys a little bit of an update on how we're doing here in New York weather-wise, and it's been crazy. Today has actually been um, a calm day compared to the tornado that touched down here and the flash flooding that's going on. So it's been a little bit crazy here in New York. Um, we're going to take a little glimpse into the missing person files. Um, this first one that I want to share with you guys, um, this is a body that was found, and... Um, uh, they need your help to identify this girl and hopefully bring her some justice and get her home with her family um, so that her family can bury her and, and know that whatever became of her. Um, an un unidentified female was found murdered on February 15, 1991 in a wooded area, area south of Bahia Honda Channel Bridge in Monroe County, Florida, near Big Coppet and Big Pine Valley, in a recreational area known as Horseshoe. She was murdered on Valentine's Day 1991 and found the, the next day. She was nude and had been strangled with a bikini top. The female had died within 24 hours of being found. Witnesses saw Jane Doe hitchhiking the day of the murder. She was last seen going northbound near mile marker 17 on U.S. Highway 1, about 18 miles from where her body was discovered. Two witnesses from the Horseshoe area independently observed an older model white pickup truck with a camper shell in the area driven by two white males. One of the witnesses saw the pickup on February 14th and the other remembers the truck in the area two or three days prior. Um, blood was discovered on a nearby dirt road. Drag marks led investigators to scattered pieces of the girl's clothing. Um, an autopsy revealed that Jane Doe was sexually assaulted and severely beaten. She is described as between 16 and 25 years old, um, ethnicity unknown. Um, she is around 5 foot 5 inches tall to 5 foot 7 er, inches tall. She weighed right around 130 pounds, had straight, short, collar length, dark brown hair, and brownish green eye color. She wore stud earrings. Each ear had four piercings. The left ear had two earrings, and the right ear had four. Um, she also wore a silver Timex wristwatch on her right wrist. Found with the female was a long-sleeved cardigan sweater with wide rows and dark purple hor horizontal stripes. Um, it was a Forenza brand, blue denim shorts, Big Yank brand, a bikini top, and a pair of black ankle-high moccasin-style shoes with red stitching and leather fringe down the back seam. Um, the br Clicks brand, size 6.5. She had stretch marks on her abdomen that indicated a previous pregnancy and two tattoos. One tattoo is a heart with, a, with the word love written inside of it on her left shoulder. The second tattoo is on her left hand, between her thumb and forefinger of a small cross with radiating lines coming from it. The female also had two teeth on the top of her mouth extracted earlier in life. She was also suffering from ovarian and fallopian tube cysts plus chronic sulfonitis that might have caused her abdomen pain and she might have sought medical assistance. She had antemortem skeletal marks of anemia, anemia fract facial recognition created by NCMEC forensic artists and depicts that would depict what the female may have looked like in life. Anyone, just go on my site, please. Go to Info to Rail, check this out. Maybe this is a girl that is missing in your area or that you may know who she was. Please go on the site, check out her picture, send it around. You know, we've got to bring justice to this girl and, and bring peace to her family. Um, 
please contact the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office at 305-743-9011 or 1-800-843-5678. That is a sad story, and, and I pray, God, that you we find out um, the you know, the name of this girl, and we give her family closure. Um, the next one is an Amber Alert for Karen Mahaffey. Age 16, was kidnapped from Winfield, Iowa, by three suspects on June 12, 2015, just before 8 p.m., in the 300 block of South Olive Street while walking home with her cousin from a school park. One of the suspects had been identified as Wilfredo Gonzalez of Burlington, Iowa. The other two have not been identified, but one is reported to be a teenage girl. The Henry County Sheriff's Office says that Mahaffey was put into a dark blue SUV as she was screaming for help. They could be heading to Texas, Indiana, or Ohio. Suspects are armed and dangerous. Karen is described as 5 foot 3 inches tall, heavy set, had dyed blonde hair with blue and green bangs, tan complexion, and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing skinny jeans and a black sleeveless t-shirt. Anyone with information on her location, please call the Henry County Sheriff's Office at 319-385-2712 or your 911, local 911 ASAP. Like I said, you guys, it's so important, so important to get these out to you guys and to find these people. Um, these are Most of these are just kids who haven't even had a chance to live yet. And think about it, if they were your children, wouldn't you want everybody that there was that was able to help to actually be helping. Um, We're going to go to a short break now, and when we return, we will have Carmen Bolter with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back um, with Carmen Bolter. Dr. Bolter is a professor at University of Calgary in Canada. She teaches in the Graduate Division of Educational Research in the Facility of Education. She has been researching and writing about the sacred feminine in ancient Egypt and goddesses around the world for two decades. Her book, Angels and Archetypes, an evolutionary map of feminine consciousness, traces fragments of information about matriarchal cultures in pre-dynastic Egypt, prehistoric Greece, and around the world. Hey, welcome, Carmen, to Info to Rail, and thank you so much for being on our show. Pleasure. Um, can you start out by telling us a little bit about you and how you became interested in your studies into Egypt? Oh, I, I've been into Egypt since I was a little girl. I started having past life memories at the age of six, and then uh, I went there for the first time in 1977. So I've been quite involved with Egypt for a long, long time. That is fascinating. Um, we see all these pyramids and all these things um, in Egypt, and that's been one of my biggest dreams is to actually get the opportunity to go there and actually witness this. Um, can you tell us about what you've, you've found and what, you know, what your studies have actually um, produced? Well, I've been there 29 times, and I lived over there for two and a half years. So um, I have been looking for... Um, I was, I was, I was. I've been looking for places that I lived in in, in another incarnation, in two other, in two three other incarnations, and so most of my um, passion and search has been to verify what I already saw somehow in my mind's eye due to this past life recall. So I saw a long time ago. I spent five years on the Giza Plateau looking um, underground, actually. Uh, for because I knew about temp, a tunnel system down there and a number of temples and so I've got photographs from 1910 of the Temple of Isis and then they cemented over the top of it so you couldn't access it anymore and so um, yeah and then I realized that the place I was looking for wasn't there and went on this big desert expedition uh, into the western desert and you know there was a, a site that may have had ties to Atlantis and so I went in there with a hot air balloon and a Russian scientist and fancy equipment and a film crew from New York and it turned out that it was modern that 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 particular site that we could see from Google Earth uh, so that wasn't it 
And so, you know, since I've, I've had some high-definition satellite scans done, and I think now there's a pretty good chance that I found what I've been looking for 95 kilometers south of Giza, connected to another pyramid. And so, still, we have not gone to verify, and um, I'm working on getting permits from the Supreme Council of Antiquities, which, you know, you never know if that's really going to happen or not. So, but I'm confident with the... Um, accuracy of these scans in other locations that they've used them that the likelihood that we found something quite remarkable here which is a total of 82 chambers on a kilometer and a half of um, passageways connecting on two distinct levels very very deep in the ground so this is quite a remarkable thing and uh, it would be really interesting if we could get in there and, and verify it I know that there's a lot of people who have actually um but on the trail of Atlantis, do you believe that Atlantis did exist and still does somewhere? Absolutely. Well, and a lot of people are like, well, it's the Bimini Road. No, it's outside the Straits, the Strait of Gibraltar, the Pillars of Hercules. No, it's the Antiplano, the high plateau in South America. And I say it's all of the above. Um, I think that it, Atlantis was a worldwide culture, a uh, seafaring culture and that their style of building cities was to make them round so ships could go in and go around and drop their cargo and get more cargo and just keep going in a circle. And so it was a very practical model. And so it wasn't just for the capital city uh, of Poseidon, which would have been in the Atlantic Ocean south of the Azores. And the Azores could have been mountains in a, in a larger Atlantis, but what's known in the texts is that there were three worldwide catastrophes in Atlantis. And Atlantis had enough, you know, length of existence to have gone on for more than one processional cycle of 26,000 years. And so, you know, there's a lot we don't know about it, of course, but it could have gone from golden ages to dark ages a few times. And so in the ancient records, they say that there was a disaster in 17,500 B.C., and on the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera, it pinpoints the last uh, worldwide catastrophe at 13,660 years ago. It's as precise as that. Wow. Um, you speak of past lives. So you believe that we all have had past lives? Oh, I don't know. I think, you know, some people are coming for the first time. Um, and a lot of people don't, don't know how to access that. But um, I, I had evidence of 85 of my past lives by the time I was 32 years old, and then I stopped counting. Why so do this you, was really important to me. I'm sorry. Um, why do you think that we, some people do have past lives? Do you think that we're, we come back over and over again to get it right, or do you think we come back, do we choose? I think that each, that this is, I call Earth lesson land. So I think we come here to learn lessons, but also we end up generating karmic relationships with certain people. And so I've done a lot of work with past life regression, having worked as a psychologist for 17 years. And, and, and when there's persistent issues with clients like bulimia, anorexia, those sorts of things, or fears, phobias, um, a lot of even, even difficult relationships with people in our family, a lot of times the imprint was set down in a previous incarnation and so when people are doing therapy just on this level, they can't act, they can't they can't crack their own case because the imprint came from it is coming from the cellular level. And so I think that um, the idea is to be conscious, to be as conscious as we can and to work to understand these relationships. But consciousness isn't a very high value in this patriarchal culture. You know, profit's the highest value instead of consciousness. So I'm pretty sure, you know, most people could access past lives and some more important than others. You know, sometimes, you know, the past lives aren't, aren't as significant as others. But, and I don't, I don't know if we, we this idea of, you know, we come to get it right. Um, I think life is full of challenges and the earth plane is a place where you can work some things out. Um and that's, that's what we do here is work things out. Um, two of my four daughters, uh, when they were littler, they would tell me, like maybe three or four years old, they would tell me um, that when they were 12 and 14 and, you know, different uh, 
years of their lives that they had a puppy with this name and, you know, that they had experienced this at this age and they were just little kids. So I wondered, I mean, what, might that be an indication that they remember this from their past lives? It could be. Um, the, thing, the thing that's really interesting to me is taking the paranormal and um, things that, you know, something like past lives and, and bringing it into the realm of science. And so in my online learning and social action network, interactiveu.com, dash the letter U, um, I have a course called Past Life Recall. And so we've got relevant research and theoretical framework in each of the courses to situate the course in terms of scientific research. And there's a lot of kids who, who spontaneously come up with things. An example would be they look at a picture in a museum or something and they say that that man's name was Scott and his wife was named and they'll name it and they say and they lived in a little white house on this street in that city and somebody will go and, and verify that and turns out it's true or someone will go to a city they've never been to before in this life and they know all the street names you know those sorts of things are quite uncanny but they are measurable and so with a double blind sort of thing where you know the kid couldn't possibly have known and then, or, or even recalling how they died and, and recognizing themselves in a picture from the Civil War or whatever. So I do think that this is measurable and scientific and also very, very useful to understand ourselves and to understand each other. Well, I, you know, at first when, when my first daughter said that to me, she said, well, when I was 12, I had a puppy and it looked just like this and its name was this. And I looked at her like, okay. And, you know, then I had a... My last daughter, she's seven now, but um, my first daughter is a Leo, and my last daughter is a Leo as well. And I, it was kind of strange to me. I have two in between, and they've never said these things, um, not quite like this in such detail. But, I mean, I have these two daughters that are one's the oldest, one's the youngest, and they can recall when they were younger details of so many things. Yeah, exactly. To me, I just did not know how to handle that at the moment. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, there's a big taboo put on it all. And, and as far back as 323 AD, Emperor Constantine made uh, reincarnation illegal. Well, how confusing does that become if, you know, you'd get killed if you remembered something. But in terms of the Egyptians and their cosmology, they were completely about, um, I was going to say recycling the soul, but the ba, the, the part of the soul that lives on, that was just normal for them. That we would not, we would be having an earth experience and we are spiritual beings. So when you see the staff that splits into duality, into a double fork, you never see it touching the ground and it's a symbol of the physical body. And it doesn't really touch. So they're emphasizing with that symbol that we, we're just, you know, coming to earth for an experience, but we don't necessarily belong here. And the other symbol that they use over and over again is the bird that can walk on the ground and fly in the air. And so it's making the association that, that there's far more of us than just this incarnation. And so we see all the time how different rules, different laws, change how we behave, change how we think, shut doors instead of opening doors. Um, I see that you wrote a book called Angels and Archetypes, um, an evolutionary map of feminine consciousness. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yep. Um, it, it's really um, a very thorough examination of goddesses, goddess-centered cultures, and it's divided into 22 archetypes, and an archetype is a Jungian construct, and whether we're conscious of it or not, they still exist. And then the higher selves of the archetypes are angels. So I devised a, a divination system where you can paint your own runes, and there's cards that go with it. And so you can do inquiries into, you know, just to gain insight. But the idea is that we need to be conscious of all these aspects. So it follows astrology, numerolo numerology, and tarot. And if um, we're run by one, so we're just holding the one ribbon. As I imagine a woman standing in the center of the circle holding all 22 ribbons. And if you drop all the ribbons and you're, you're only holding one, um, the Persephone daughter, for example, um, and, and then we're run by it like a complex. Or if we avoid one or two, like Baba Yaga, I call her the queen of the bad hair day, then, then that gets relegated to our shadow. And so what the, the more we can do to understand all of the elements 
on the wheel, cardinal fixed mutable, how astrology goes, the more we can um, reflect in terms of these archetypal energies, the more we can become conscious. I have, um, I've been doing tarot readings since I was young, probably, I think the first time I actually got a set of tarot cards, I was maybe 13, and I've been doing them ever since, and um, I'm pretty accurate, I've never had anybody tell me that, you know, I wasn't accurate in my readings and such, and I love the runes as well, um, I've done the runes a few times, um, so this stuff really, you know, interests me, so I'm going to have to definitely get your book. Good. I'm just republishing it actually with a new set of cards and a new set of runes that will go with it, and I'll publish it as an ebook. I'm just I just got the the final art on it two days ago, so I'll move toward formatting it. And uh, but it's still a, there's a couple of um, copies left in print from the last run. So, do you believe that we all have um, our guardian angels that watch over us and guide us? Yes, but if we're not in touch and we don't listen to them, then I think they kind of go away. So if a, an angel's telling you to bring an umbrella and you say, well, the weather report said it's not going to rain and then it rains, I always say if I, was, if I was their guardian angel, I'd go help somebody else. And so I think that we need to have some kind of a communication with them in order for them to stay and actually be useful. And, and we need to interact with them in some way. So guardian angel perhaps is... Well, you can call it whatever you like. I mean, that, that, that's a, a, a simplified uh, notion in my mind. I mean, I think we have, you know, ascended masters that can help us, and there's many different levels of uh, the angelic realms that we can interact with. And again, this was normal to the ancient Egyptians. How do we know when oh. we're hearing from our specific, you know, from these angels? How do we know what we're listening for? Well, it all, it all comes to training. I mean, I think we, we have to, you know, work these things systematically and, you know, learn from people who understand it well. And uh, at Harmonic Convergence in 1987, I was at a, a training uh, workshop for learning to be a conscious channel. And someone asked that question, and the instructor said, you're not smart enough to make it up. <laughs> and I thought that, that was just a brilliant statement, because... You know, we can have reverse egoism, oh, well, like, you know, like I could never make that, you know. So we just have to learn how, how, how to listen. And to me, it's just mind-boggling that we live in a society that uh, if you can't see it, it's not there. And that these things are, are kind of shunned or thought of as weird because to me, it's the most normal thing. Absolutely. Um, you know, in the last probably month, um, I've always been somebody who's been very close to God or, you know, very big into God, but in the last month I've grown, I think, a lot. Um, I've handed my life over to God, and, and He took the wheel in this. Um, and, you know, when you do that, you start to, I guess, recognize um, a little bit more of, of what He's saying to you, and, and, you know, you kind of feel a little bit more of the, the angels around you or, or what they're trying to help you with. So, you know, little by little, I think I'm, I'm getting there. But I think your book would be great, and, and I'm, you know, v looking forward to getting it and, and learning. That, you know, that's one of the reasons why I do this show. I love to learn, and I love to grow. And this is the stuff that just is so fascinating. Well, and I think we have to be careful. I mean, I think of it as father, mother, God, and my book is all about the goddess-centered cultures that were matriarchal. And, you know, the, I think patriarchy is really out of balance. So even, you know, I kind of twinge a little bit when you say God is he, because I don't know that we, we actually get to do that. I think it's a, a masculine and feminine, sacred masculine, sacred feminine, which is what, again, the ancient Egyptians were very um, clear about, that it wasn't just one-sided, just masculine. I don't think that's, I don't think that's verifiable, though... Um, religion, you know, has kind of indicated that it's a father god who's punitive and the lightning bolt that's going to strike us down. So um, I think spirituality brings us, I mean, it's, it's a good enough concept to, to surrender into a higher purpose. Well, I've, I've had other people that I've spoken with who said that there is, you know, the father-mother parts of God and um, that they talk to them separately depending on exactly what it is that they are talking to God about. Um, and I don't really know what to think of that. So have you heard of that? 
well, it's, it's, to me, it's a, it's a personal relationship that we develop, but I think that by lopping off the sacred feminine, that we've gotten ourselves into a lot of trouble in this society, and that's also the agenda of the patriarchy is to erase evidence of everything other than itself. So, you know, take a woman out of the Bible largely, except for maybe the Queen of Sheba, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, you know, dis her, and everything else is all this patriarchs. And I think that's really dangerous because, you know, the matriarchal consciousness is about balance and it's about connection to nature and leaving more for, you know, the next generations and that sort of thing. And patriarchy is very power over, hierarchical, me, mine, don't have to care about anybody but ourselves. And so I think the trouble that the planet's in right now comes from those kinds of values that don't insist on a balance. Well, that makes sense. I'm I'm living, learning and growing every day. Um, so this stuff here is, you know, what helps me to grow. Um, do you believe that uh, what is written in, like, in the Bible right now, do you believe that that's coming to pass? Um, do you believe in the revelations of the Bible and such? Well, one of my sayings is you don't have to believe it. I think belief is also dangerous because that's, that's kind of blind. But, you know, there's, there's interpretations that say that, you know, that, 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 that there was a vision in the past when, when the Bible perhaps was being written that, you know, was, 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 was written down. I mean, I, I, I don't like talking about the Bible really because there's, you know, people have a lot of beliefs that go with it and I don't want to offend anybody. Um, but I also think it's been reinterpreted so many times that it can't possibly be accurate. And if we were talking, you know, like it was written 300, 400 years after Jesus. And so, you know, if we were having a conversation 400 years from now about this, but what we're talking about now, chances are we'd, we'd make some mistakes <laughs> and not be very accurate about the context of our conversation. So, yeah, let's just leave that. Okay. Um, I know that you did extensive research in the archives of the Egyptian Museum. Um, can you tell us about that? Well, I, I, my research was endorsed by the Canadian Embassy in Cairo and the Egyptian Embassy in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, I needed special permission to get into these three different um, institutions. One was the archives of the National Museum of, um, of Egypt, and one was the American University in Cairo, and the third one was the Faculty of Archaeology at Cairo University. So I had to get a lot of paperwork done to be allowed to go onto these campuses and uh, to the National Museum. And both the um, Rare Books Library and the National Museum Archives, you know, are restricted to students that are actually um, enrolled in programs in Egypt. And so that in itself was actually quite a privilege to be able to go in there. But the way they've organized their work, they've got everything um logged, but you have to go in there and know what you're asking for. The other library that's like that is the Vatican. So you have to say, I mean, do you have the book called, from, you know, from Francis Bacon? And if, you know, then they'll go get it for you. But they don't just have a listing like most libraries do where you can go through the catalog or do a search. And so you really have to be clear about what you're looking for. But it was, I, I was looking for anything that had to do with Blue Lotus, the Sacred Feminine, uh, sacred dance, high-level initiate training, that sort of thing, in the archives. But also what was found like on the Giza Plateau, so in the Rare Books Library of the Faculty of Archaeology of Cairo University, they had all the field notes of anyone who had ever done an excavation on the Giza Plateau. And so they were in German, French, English, and Arabic. And so I just spent the whole summer going every day to one of these institutions and pouring through books, but I've done a lot of research in my time, so that's kind of a normal activity for me, and and commit, committing them all to notes, because I, I couldn't take anything with me, and I couldn't photocopy anything, I just have to write things in a notebook and draw drawings, and that's what led to the manuscript that led to the Pyramid Code, uh, that research. Um, who were the ancients? And, you know, did they have more technology than, than we do? Well, of course. I mean, have you seen the Pyramid Code? Um, yes, and it fascinates me. Um, I know that you have, you know, your, your made-for-television documentary. Um, but can you tell our listeners who the ancients were? Well, it's a loose word. I mean, basically, it's, it's going into prehistory. Um, and again, history is when the soldiers came, and it's his story. So, 
the ancient Egyptians are the civilization that came, you know, before dynastic Egypt, and even dynastic Egypt, they're still considered the ancients. Um, that's a very uh, loose term. It's a difficult term to deal with because you call the ancient of days. There's all kinds of things that have been written. And again, it's really difficult to to see where to put those, you know, the notions because anybody can say anything and they do. So, um, you know, it depends. If you just typed in ancients, you know, you get ancient aliens, you get all kinds of things. And so what I'm talking about when I say the ancients is is th th those that, formulated what's on the temple walls, if we're talking about Egypt, um, left the symbolism for us to get triggered in some way. They were somehow leaving records of their belief system. So the people that came way before modern culture. How do you believe they made these temples with, you know, being that the stone is so heavy and, and such, how do you believe they made them? Okay, again, I don't, it's, you don't have to believe it. I think that it's important to explore and, 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 and connect things and, and look for primary sources um, and not, you know, speculate and say it's true because I said so. So there's, it, we're never going to know for sure, which is why we're trained in PhDs to hedge, could be, data seems to indicate. So, you know, I've come to think certain things because of, you know, you know, spending so much time in Egypt, going there 29 times and living there for two and a half years uh, over since 1977. I have come to think that the stones were poured, that they had high-level technology that was sound and light technology, that they were able to transmute the atom, which, you know, which has to do with levitation, bilocation, manifestation, alchemy, bilocation and teleportation. So once they could blow the, the hydrogen-oxygen mo molecule apart in the physical, they were able to make a different kind of implosive, passive, non-polluting energy. And we are made out of water. So the high-level initiates were also, they had abilities. And once they got one ability, they could, they could get um, supercharged up into the ninth level of initiation and they would literally get these abilities. So we are so removed from what they knew and what they practiced and what was normal for them. And we're so dumbed down and we're told we've got the best technology and we're the smartest we've ever been. Nothing could be farther from the truth because, you know, the Egyptians were all about, you know, blood from life, not blood from death. And even patriarchal Egypt is all about, um, you know, the, 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 well, patriarchal Egypt is dynastic Egypt. So then they started as you got later in the dynasties to, you know, fight with each other and war and Ramsey's cutting off the hands of his enemy. So I think it's a very, very important distinction to look at how the value system existed in a different way. And so we owe it to ourselves, I think, um, you know, to understand what was possible in the past and to see just how far we've gone wrong. Do you think there are still a lot of secrets hidden um, that, we, that we haven't found? Well, I think that there's a lot of repression that things have been found and then they get buried again. So one of the things that goes on with archaeology is if they find something and it doesn't fit in terms of the date or it doesn't fit in terms of what it's depicting, they bury it again. That's a common practice. Or they'll give it to the Smithsonian or something like that and they'll put all these artifacts into a boat and go dump them in the ocean. That's a fact. And so uh, if it doesn't fit the accepted story, it gets distorted, hidden, forgotten. Yes, uh, you know, again, impossible to estimate, but it could be that, you know, no more than 10% of what we see in Egypt is, is excavated. Wow. That there's a tremendous amount that's underground and all over the world. That archaeology is a destructive science, it's expensive, it's laborious, and, you know, governments aren't that interested necessarily in supporting the truth, because they're more interested in, you know, my God's better than your God, and warring, and 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 it, it just is so far out of balance that I, I don't think that we've, the, the real information has gotten enough airtime. Yet, people are curious about where did we come from? You know, what are we doing here? And what's the point of, of being here at all? So there are many secrets all over the world. So somebody like Klaus Donna from Vienna, he told me that he has some 150 to 200 high-definition satellite scans of sacred sites that are not excavated yet. 
Wow. Yeah. I absolutely, I think that um, archaeology is, is amazing. It's very fascinating. And, you know, for, for people like me who, you know, I'm not, I have no permits or anything else or, or any kind of, you know, you know, I'm not, it's not something that I do, but for somebody like me, um, who would love to check this stuff out, um, do you have any places that you would recommend? No, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's no, I, I don't, I don't necessarily recommend books and that sort of thing. Cause I think that because I taught quantitative research methods at the grad, graduate level and I see how few people actually do research properly where they're giving credit where credit is due and we live in a time of huge piracy and stealing intellectual property that I think that it, you know there's 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 a lot of people who stand up on stage and say it's true because I said so uh, you know and I think TV and media and Hollywood has you know done a disservice by saying it is this person did this on this day and they're guilty of this and this and that's it, you know. And then you find out that you know a lot of people are wrongly sentenced. Uh, a lot of information is 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 poorly reported, and that the only hope we have, I think, is to develop our inner senses so that we have a, a feeling of openness if something's correct, or a feeling of contraction if something's incorrect, and that we we owe it to ourselves to develop those 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 senses that discernment. So that we can pick our way through, because no, nothing's a hundred percent accurate. But you know, they say a channel session could be eighty-five percent accurate. Well, which fifteen isn't? And so, if we don't insist on developing this capacity to tell the difference, I I think we just swim around in almost truths. Um, if I were to actually have the opportunity in my lifetime to go to Egypt, um, would I be able to, you know, look around in these? these um, temples and stuff? Absolutely. You go buy a ticket and you go into the temple. However, anybody who goes to Egypt has to have a guide and the Egyptologists are memorized scripts that Ramses did this and usually they're looking at the warring factions and most of the ones that are, are guiding you don't know about the deep, deep history and the story of the high-level initiates and how they worked and the high technology. And so if you were to go just ordinarily as a tourist, you would be filled with stories that I, when I'd hear them, like being there by myself and overhearing the Egyptologist telling the story, I would just feel like I was going to pass out. And I didn't even realize why, but the story was just so plainly wrong that uh, I, I, my sensibilities couldn't cope with it. So you have to be careful. And, and, and so there's plenty of opportunities to get mixed information that isn't quite accurate so it's not as easy as just going however if you stand in an Egyptian temple the sacred geometry is such that it reflects the cavities of the human body and it's exactly proportional so the very act of standing in a, in a true ancient temple uh, can have an effect on the human psyche that may not be direct and also the pyramids are, you know, macrocosm, microcosm, again, of nature. So the, the natural state of a human, the physical environment of the planet, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe, all of that is micro, macro reflecting. And so everything in Egypt is multidimensional and has multiple levels of meaning. And so you don't just go stand there and understand everything. And if you want to get confused, listen to the tour guides. Um, are there uh, pyramids and such um, here in New York, where I live? No. No. There, some people say that there's, there's pyramids being discovered in North America, but it's the least likely place um, to find pyramids. There's pyramids that are turning up now in Java, the Philippines, Alaska, Antarctica, Serbia, Bosnia, Russia, China, all over the world, uh, but not necessarily, um, well, uh, maybe somebody's going to find one, but there's a lot of straight-sided pyramids that were covered with silt with, at the end of the flood that was such that it was deep enough to actually grow trees, so when you look at a straight-sided pyramid, a perfect example would be the Pyramid of the Sun in Bosnia. The trees are all different heights, 
So when you look from a distance, it doesn't look like a straight-sided pyramid because of the trees. But once it's excavated, you can see that it's it's the course. It's, it meets all the characteristics of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. They're the same. Fascinating. Were these pyramids, way way older than you would think? Go ahead. Would these pyramids be built um, basically uh, to um, for the people when they died? Is is that what the pyramids were basically built for? Well, if you watch the pyramid code, I hope you got the point that they're not tombs. And so the story that we get in school came from Herodotus in 450 BC, and he went to Egypt and met some local people who filled him full of stories, and he went home and repeated it, and we've been teaching that ever since. Uh, there have, there's never been a mummy found in a straight-sided pyramid. Flat-topped mastabas are a different story. Step pyramids are a different story. And uh, they are energy devices. They have nothing to do with housing dead bodies at all. The Egyptians didn't have a word for death. They are not tombs by any stretch of the imagination, and that's just the way it is. Well, that's a big confusion because so many people, you know, that you talk to say that that's basically what they were. And well, that's because we're taught that in school. We're told the Egyptians were kind of childlike, misguided, worshipped animals, obsessed with death. Uh, the ego of the pharaoh was what the pyramids were built for and, as tombs. Nonsense. It's complete nonsense. And, and, and the, but the thing is, is that we're fed. We're fed a lot of um, untruths. And truth is, this is one of my big pet peeves. It's like truth is an option. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be true. How, how, like, that's what the alternative media is looking to do, is to debunk what we were told. But, you know, quantum physics, you know, history, all these different subjects are not giving us the, the tools or the abilities to access the truth. They're just superimposing this on us and repeat, repeat, repeat through propaganda and then trying to, you know, sell us products. That's the essence of public relations that came, that was coined through uh, Freud's nephew, Berets. And all of it is about, you know, turning us into unconscious consumers so people can get rich. Well, that's not what we're here for. We're not here to get more stuff. We really are here to understand things. Absolutely. Um, there's so many people that, you know, are out there digging and looking for remains um, to see if the Nephilim existed and such. Um, do you believe that they're finding what they're stating? Well, again, the word belief. I'm really, I, I think it's important to, to feel a deep sense of knowing and just idle beliefs, I just don't, it's, it's, it's not the way, it's not in my vocabulary that way. Now, I was going to say, how's that going? Because the, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, Sitchin had an office in the Rockefeller Tower, and when I went to listen to him speak, and people would ask questions, he'd say, it's in my book. And I got the sense that he couldn't even remember what he wrote or how it fit together. And then nobody could verify his work. I happen to have a PhD in computational linguistics. And um, uh, Mike Heisner came later and had a PhD in foreign languages and linguistics of dead languages. And his website is sitchiniswrong.com. Because you get a turn of phrase, Chinese people sit in a chair, we sit on a chair, a preposition, a verb tense, masculine, feminine getting mixed up, and you can easily change the meaning of a word and, and then give the whole different message. So there's a lot of that going on. That's one point. The other point is that older is deeper. So when Sitchin's saying that 450,000 years ago and the Lenenki came down and they kept their bodies for 450,000 years, well, we have trouble thinking that Moses might have been 800 years old. 450,000 years is a long time to hang on to one body. And so I don't know that a lot of people are digging and finding evidence of the Nephilim. Uh, there are... Michael Cremo, who I'm speaking with at the Modern Knowledge Tour in Vancouver, August 29th and uh, Victoria, August 30th, you know, he's he's the one that's given us the gift of something that could be a million years old, uh, using different dating techniques and finding out of place skeletons that could have been giant that are much much older, and piecing that together. But he's he's endured decades of ridicule because he's telling a different story. So the media, mainstream media, has certain parameters of what you're allowed to talk about. And so we're really quite crippled when it comes to understanding this material. And I, I actually, actually, that conference where I met Sitchin back in 96, 
they had a round table discussion and invited me to come on the on the Monday after the weekend workshop, the weekend conference. And scientists hadn't talked to one another. And if they were, you know, cultural anthropologists, they couldn't speak to archaeologists, they couldn't speak to the geologists, and, you know, all, the, the, they all realized the dating techniques don't work well. Carbon-14, they took one sample and sent it to 14 different labs and came up with 14 different dates. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people, maybe most certain people that are talking about the proof of the Anunnaki, and I think proof is, is too strong a word, and I think it's misleading. However, there are also people who have had, you know, visions of complexes from 450,000 years ago. And for all the material on disclosure and extraterrestrials, whatever you want to call them, off-planet beings coming here, well, where's the stuff? And how would you know? But because older is deeper in archaeology, and archaeology just started in 1910, well, we've had people like Flinders Petrie who dug in Egypt for 10 years from 1881 to 1891, but still, he wasn't an archaeologist because we didn't have that yet, right? Right. So psychology and archaeology actually came into being in 1910 at the same time. And that's when Darwin was around and Champollion, when, when uh, the hieroglyphic text was, you know, being translated, but Darwin had doubts about his own thesis, Champollion had doubts about his own thesis, and there was some kind of kind of pressure to push that forward. You know, Freud's talking about penis envy. You know, there was a lot of mistakes that were just handed over whole and that have been just repeated and repeated. So I'm very interested in this subject, but I'm not sure that just by saying, yeah, yeah, that's Anunnaki or yeah, that's the Nephilim, that it, you know, that it actually adds up to that. Now, even with giants, if you, if you go Google image giants, you know, there's pictures there where a man is standing and he's the height of the giant's ear. Well, well how, how big is that being then? You know, that being is going to be what? 200 feet tall? Um, is that possible? So there's a lot of misinformation, you know, that kind of gets in the way of us learning how to... We need to learn to think in a different way, and we need to connect to our own inner wisdom, you know, and, and, and this is the journey of consciousness, and um, it's, it's not that easy. I worked as a psychologist for 17 years in Alberta, in Canada, and, um, you know, it's, it's a long road to sort the seeds out of what's true and what isn't true. Now, having said that, um, you know, again, people like Klaus Donna have found uh, beings, skeletons, that are 25 feet high. Well, they're lying down, and they're still interred, but... You know, the, the, this, this, this is coming out, but it's not coming out in a way that's just whole, that it's a, new, it's a new belief system, if you will. So, you know, the, the other thing, the issue I have with, with Sitchin is that they, they say that we were enslaved and they turned us into a slave species so that we could mine gold for them. And I think it's a very dangerous implication because the implication is we were enslaved then and that we're not enslaved now. And I think we're in open air prison planet, you know, in our own way here that, you know, it's not, we're not that free. We're told what to think. We're told what to eat, what to buy, you know, and uh, it may not necessarily be in our best interest. So there's a lot of problems around that. And having said all that, I'm very interested if we could possibly find something that may lend itself to, you know, the data lining up that somebody was here then and who they were and what they thought. But, you know, in the meantime, the ancient Egyptians, you know, and, and pre-flood 13,000 years ago is a lot more recent than 450,000 years ago. Absolutely. So I think we need to tread really carefully in that realm. Absolutely. Um the pyramids and stuff have always been of great interest to me because, I mean, they're they're just so unique and they're so defined and they're it, to me that's amazing. Um, well, you were, I mean, when you went to Egypt on all these trips, is there anything that you guys, you know, you and your your team dug up that was actually um, that you can share with us? No. Almost nobody gets to do excavations in Egypt and, you know, perhaps uncovering a temple that was already at Karnak that was damaged by um, an earthquake. But archaeological teams 
all, pretty much all of them got canceled, you know, with the revolution. And um, no, it's I, I have gotten permits to film and permits to, well, to film aerial footage. The Minister of Defense in Egypt had to sign the order for me to get the permission to fly in a helicopter, an army helicopter, an like Air Force helicopter. So getting permits is almost impossible, almost impossible. And so the idea that somebody would just go, go there and dig and find something is, is not, not accurate. Other countries seem to have perhaps more relaxed rules about that, but you still need to have, you know, primary, secondary archaeologists that are responsible for the actual dig. Because as I said, in archaeology, archaeology is a destructive science, and we need to leave the archaeological record in a way that if somebody came along in 50 or 100 years with different ideas, they could trace back what was done, which is what is in the archives from way back in, in the rare books library of all, you know, how many people were on the dig in that day, and what did they find, and just accurately recording all of this. And so um, now the discoveries for, for me have been, you know, photographing a lot of these temples and then looking at series of symbols and, and, and looking to decipher what they may be and, and, and to put a, a, a pattern together of what were they, what are they trying to tell us without imposing our own belief system on top of what we're seeing with them, right? So, so how can we be as objective as possible and link back to a higher set of values to understand what we're seeing on the temple walls? But the idea of, of digging and finding a statue is, is almost impossible. And there's almost been nothing new since King Tut. I'm wondering if we will ever... Uh, come close to catching up to the technology that the Egyptians had? Well, I think that there's a lot of free energy devices that may have been reverse engineered from crashes of, you know, we, you know, we don't have disclosure. We, Mexico, Argentina, Russia, you know, there's a lot of different countries that have, even the UK, Canada, opened their UFO files. But the idea, the United States has not, the United States refuses to disclose and, and, and there's black budgets and that have reverse engineered a lot of this free technology. And we're all trapped inside paying high utility bills, the patriarchal ways of being and thinking that go with utility companies. They're always right. They always add to it. They drive you crazy when you try to argue with them. And literally, we shouldn't be paying insurance, taxes, interest, um, or utilities. All that should be free. Who's enslaved? We are. By that. Absolutely. And so we have the free technology, the patents are there, 6,000 patents have been repressed. Will we ever access the technology? Well, first, we're, we're in a very dense time right now, and, you know, usually the, the, the high technology is in the golden age, and now we're at the bottom of the iron age. And so I think that the energy fields are, are a bit dense right now for us to access what they knew. However, we have the same DNA as they did. I'm talking about the ancient Egyptians that lived in pre-dynastic Egypt that were able to do a lot of, had a lot of these abilities, as I said, teleportation, all of that. And look how many people are just absolutely riveted to anything Star Trek. Because on some level, you know, you know Stargate, all of these kinds of um, concepts are real to us in some way, but there's a lot of fuzz between us being able to realize, you know, what it means. And, and so... Hopefully, we'll get to this free technology. And there's a lot of stuff out there. People are, you know, th there's a lot, a lot of people talking about free energy, and yet it's been blocked. So if you look at the Thrive movement, you know, they, you know, factories would burn down, and, and they, they've really made a concerted effort to protect people who are uh, developing these kinds of, of technologies. So I think we're in a pretty sorry state because there's a few people who make a lot of money by getting the rest of our rest of the people's money and that's where it goes insurance taxes interest you know compounded interest for houses everything's inflated i think it's a very very dangerous and dire situation that we're in and that our salvation could necessitate that we get this free technology um can you tell us about the courses that you teach interactiveu.com is um, 
uh, it's, a, it's an online learning and social action network. So I've developed uh, nine faculties. There's, there's 10 full programs in there and 31 courses. I've been teaching this way for 15 years. Um, and um, so I developed this whole uh, online uh, learning platform. And what it is is cross-disciplinary, intercultural, multimedia, interactive online curriculum. And so it's steeped in strong theoretical framework of social constructivism. So it, it's a new paradigm in education. I've been studying alternative education since 1973 and, um, and certainly studying and, and, and working with online learning for 15 years. And so uh, really the idea is, okay, if you go to university now, particularly in the States, you could end up with fifty to $200,000 of student loans, compounded interest, you pay it back and it's still mounting, mounting. And at the end, there's not necessarily a job. But everything in, in academia, as I mentioned before, is, is isolated. So social anthropology doesn't speak to cultural anthropology. So we can't figure out what's going on because we can't blend. We haven't been taught how to blend and be cross-disciplinary, which is why linguistics was a choice for me in my PhD because cognitive psychology, social anthropology, all these different things blend with how you come up with learning a language. And so... Um, the, the, we, we start with where people are and constructivism means you make something, you build something. You write a book, you make a documentary, you start a business, e-commerce business. And, you know, the, the premise is if nobody's there to give you a job, how can you, you know, tap into who you really are and develop your skills that are linked to your passions and create something that's a value that then can be, um, turned around and, and, and distributed, you know, for, with, to people. And it's almost impossible because, you know, we need a whole new paradigm altogether and people have are damaged by the education system. So, you know, and I think that uh, school damages people's self-esteem. Only one person comes first. Everybody else sort of failed. And we don't make anything. We critique Shakespeare, right? We, we um, deconstruct a play instead of making and building something. The other thing is it's collaborative. And so um, I, I, I don't see really how we have to make everything ourselves. Why can't we get with other people that are interested and collaborate and, 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 and work together on things because it makes for a better product. So uh, it's, we've been running it for a while and I actually have a 14 year old in there. I'm so proud of her. She just handed in a 45 page paper in academic writing format with five pages of references and her topic, her research question was what happened to our lost knowledge? And my thing is that you, you, you can say whatever you want if you support it properly, right? With, with correct referencing, pr primary references. The internet is all full of secondary references, people talking about each other's work, which isn't the same thing. And you can get ancient texts online, but you need to go to the, 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 the source of who did the research. And so, you know, the fact that I'm teaching people how to do this and that, you know, a, a, a young adult can, can, can achieve this, is, it, it shows that it's, people, people are trainable if they have enough support, enough mentoring, and they're in an environment that allows them to blossom. And the other thing is that uh, everybody's got an uneven skills and gaps in their learning. And, you know, we need to not be embarrassed about that. So the only thing you really need to be able to do it is a proper internet connection and a functional computer and, and the time to, you know, get in there and, and understand uh, what you're about. So there's um, ecotourism and there's esoteric arts and it's, it's, it's largely, you know, psychological, if you will, given that I worked as a psychologist for 17 years. But, you know, what's the psychology of learning? And, and how can you um, support people to, to literally um, create what would make them fulfilled? So I say, if you're an employer, would you rather see a certificate from a website building course that a person has or see the website they built? I would rather see the website they built because anybody can get a certificate and then not have any output. And so people learn how to do real research and all of that. And so hopefully they're connecting in a way that they can stand on their own two feet and develop something 
that's uniquely theirs that they can then employ themselves with. Because I don't think that, you know, employers, the, the, the big guy at the top gets all the money and the little guys at the end of the line, you know, don't make much money, not enough to survive in this world. So we really have a problem. That doesn't mean that, you know, this is catching on easily because, you know, people are completely overwhelmed with, you know, bills and busyness and, and, and we also have interactive school for kids, which, you know, a lot of parents want to take their kids out of school. Like the, fa- the people have lost their confidence in the education system. And I say rightfully so. I certainly have. I certainly have. I have a 13-year-old who um, has been diagnosed with ADHD, and it just seems like, you know, she's got an IEP in place um, to help her learn, but it just seems like they don't want to be bothered. It's it's easier for her to fall through the cracks and for them to pass her, even if she's not understanding. It's easier for them to say, go home at the end of the day instead of stay after and I'll help you. And I've certainly lost a lot of credibility in our education, education system all the way around. Well, the DSM uh, Diagnostic Criteria is this huge book, and what it is is labeling made-up psychological, psychiatric um, diagnoses so that you can say what drug you can put with it and none of it's useful. None of them are tested in a way, you know, and I, you know, so many people are on antidepressants and diagnosed with ADHD, but the thing is, is that it's wrong to have kids sitting in classrooms, you know, they need to be running around outside and so everything about school is the banking system of education, the teacher deposits the information, the student gives it back on the test, but the school now is guessing what the teacher wants you to say. And, and, and a professor at a university who's correcting papers will tell you what to say and what to say less of and what to say more of. And this is just repetition of the, of the propaganda. It has absolutely nothing to do with personal development, life skills, uh, or earning a living. It has to do with, you know, the, the, the school was set up by the, you know, to make people good factory workers. But the other thing that I think is absolutely tragic is physical schools are built by the people who build physical jails. And, you know, kids have got to be, you know, tested for metal before they go in and they have to operate by bells. I mean, it's basically, I'm sorry to say it this way, but schools seem to be preparing people for jail, not for life. I agree. Well, that's tragic. It is. And, you know, I, I homeschooled my first two girls um, for a couple of years and their growth and learning was so much bigger and so much, you know, they had it, it was amazing. And I'm I'm thinking along those lines with my 13 year old as well. Um, I'm just this, this whole school thing. I remember going to school and it was all about clicks and it was all about if you fit in and it was all about this and that, but it was never about, you know, how do I learn to be an adult in this world? How do I learn to live in this world and and survive in this world? They don't teach you survival tactics of, of any sorts. Well, and the other thing too, is that we have encyclopedias or encyclopedic knowledge in our cell phones. And so in, when I worked as a professor in Taiwan for four years, everybody had a phone. And so I thought, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Like, let's make movies with the cell phones. Let's use them as translation, you know, devices. And instead of taking the phones away, we don't need to memorize lists of things. Because, A, if you knew every single thing that was on the Internet right now, it would have changed and become obsolete almost in 15 minutes or one day. And so it's not the same world. So, you know, to memorize lists and all that is completely irrelevant. Absolutely. Um, my father passed in October. Um, before that, though, he used to read my girls' history books, and you know, he lived a lot of the things that were in the history books. And he said that's kind of funny that that's not the way I remembered them. So, and and you know, I have to tell my kids constantly, you know, what you're looking up on the internet is not always the truth of it. You're you're not going to always find the facts and the truth of everything on the internet. A lot of it's well, disinformation. Sorry. Well, but yes, and there's disinformation in the alternative media, and there's certainly ample disinformation on the real media, but that's what the most important skill 
is how do we detect if something is true or not, if it feels right or not. And so I don't think that these mechanisms are shut down, which is why the Pyramid Code had such an overwhelming impact on people. And I ended up with some 14,000 letters from people saying, oh my God, I know this is true, I feel it. Because there's so much that's not true that scrambles us, that confuses us, and that's how propaganda works. So if you do what's called cognitive dissonance, if you tell something, and if you watch CNN for five minutes, you'll get contradictions. So you say one thing, contradict it, contradict it, and then send the message for what you're going to buy for the advertising route. It's Absolutely. just, that's how it works. That's, that's, and, they, and, and life now is propaganda. You know, pretty much everything they tell us is true is not true. Uh, the legal system, the injust, justice system is unjust. Uh, you know, what's people get blamed is, so they can close is, a case. Yeah. It's adversarial. Well, what, what do you need adversarial for? Why can't we do mediation when we're separating? You know, how can you fight over kids? The kids are your kids. You know, you have to find out how to, how to share responsibility for them. Like, it's just nothing. It doesn't work. We are in such a mess in terms of hurting the planet, not caring, pollution, you know, all of it. It's just, and people can't cope with, you know, like if you find out the whales are beaching themselves and, you know, kids are starving to death, like we end up building a window of tolerance and we, we can't fit any more in it. And so people, oh, I don't want to hear about that. Nothing I can do about the starving kids anyway. But the thing is, we do have to care. And, and you know, in the ancient times, they, take, they took bodhisattva vows. And the idea is as long as one person is suffering, I'm not free. You know, we have to care for everyone. Oh, you shouldn't be so sensitive. Oh, you know, just oh, your only responsibility is to keep yourself happy. It's like, well, what's the value of that? <laughs> you know, like to me, that doesn't even resonate as anything that's interesting. I agree with that. There's too many people who turn to turn their back or turn a blind blind eye on, you know, the needs of other people. And I think that if we band together, and if if we all took care of each other, there would be no one left out. Well, the, the, we have to clean up the mess because what we're talking all. We don't just mean North America. We mean all the whole planet. Absolutely. I mean, we walked the beach last summer, and I was in awe of how many dead fish were on the shores. Um, we asked the guy how many, you know, dead fish he was cleaning up a day, and he said between 8 and noon um, in the morning he was cleaning up over 500 in just that area. And, you know... Nobody's taking responsibility. We're killing Mother Earth. We're doing this stuff, and nobody seems to point a finger at themselves. It's to me. Well, I don't. Ag I don't agree with that. Actually, I think we. You know, you, we're doing it. Well, I, I'm not doing it. You're not doing it. I mean, if there's any opportunity to do something good for um, the planet, and uh, it's it's the corporations, it's the it's the lobbyists, it's the the people who make money that are doing it, right? who cut corners, who, who, who don't get rid of the toxic chemicals properly, who don't care because they're disconnected and they're all about power over me, mine, you only live once, uh, I want, you know, I want the, the most I can get for me and, and, and it, it's insanity because these people have grandchildren who need to breathe. So it's completely illogical, it's driven, the point's driven home that it's all about profit and at the end, what do you have if you've got a whole bunch of money and the planet's all, it doesn't work. But this, it, it, it's not, I don't like that when people say, we're doing it. I don't blame me. I didn't mean it like that. I really didn't. I meant, you know, exactly what you said. It's, you know, we need to get back to our original fruits. We need to, you know, cl clean up the, the mess and clean up our act, you know, me, I'm not a money person. I, I don't think money's ever going to buy you anything that's ever going to make you happy or, or fix anything. You know, for me, it's when I take my last breath, I'm not taking money with me either. I would like to leave behind a world that my children and their children and their children can live in that's pure. Well, and that's what the North American Indians were all about, leaving things for seven generations and living in harmony with nature. And they certainly had big skill sets if they could live outside in the winter. But when Columbus came, they were living in uh, wooden houses on the East Coast, and they had markets for art and markets for food, and they had it organized. And then the, 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 the white guys came along and, you know, said they were savages and killed millions and millions of buffalo. 
in a totally savage way. So we've got it all backwards. We've just got it all backwards. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think that, I don't know if we'll ever see it in our lifetime, but I pray that we do, that, you know, we, we see a change. We see a saving of Mother Earth, and, I, you know, to, to see a turnaround would be amazing. You know, I got two older girls, and, and I don't want their lives to be like this. I, I want them to have a wholesome, pure place to live in where they can actually live freely and happily. Well, freely in a way you can afford it. You know, another little syndrome here is that I get asked to speak at conferences. And in the last couple of weeks, three of them have been canceled because the amount of money it costs to fly the speakers in exceeds the amount of money that you can charge the people who would come. And so the system gets our money in fuel surcharge and, you know, high expenses for hotels. And the system gets all the money. So for me... Anything I can do to stay out of the system, to stay out of the stores, to minimize any kind of interaction with the system is where my energy starts to rebuild in nature and my energy gets drained in the system. So anybody who, you know, thinks that doing a nine to five job under fluorescent lights and, you know, your 15 minute break and, you know, you know, all for the profit of somebody else, I don't know that that's any way to live and it's so incredibly draining that at the end of the day, people don't have the energy to do anything to rebuild themselves. Not enough. It's taken more from them and in the, in the time they have. Um, it gets wasted on commuting. It gets wasted on some kind of entertainment, you know, something to make you feel better because the, ener the system drained you. So we really, uh, we really, really, really need to be careful and notice, you know, what drains our energy and what gives us energy. Absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I'm, I used to work, I've worked two jobs to support my kids, but you know what? It's so draining by the time you get home and by the, the, all the money you spent to get them there or to get to work and your kids have child care and you're not making enough money and by the end of the day you can't even enjoy your kids because you're, you got bills to pay and you don't have the money to even, you know, for me... I'm not somebody who even likes to go to town. If I have to go get groceries, that is a, oh, I don't want to go do this. And it just, it's a big stress. I don't even want to go out there and spend money on this stuff because, you know, you can grow it in your backyard and it's wholesome and it's, it's not tainted. And it's, so I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I agree. Um, can you give us all your websites um, and links and such so that, we can get them out to the listeners so that they can find your information. Okay. Pyramidcode.com is my main website and I've got posted recent interviews, upcoming events, uh, and my Indiegogo campaign that la launched three days ago. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to raise some funds to finish my next documentary series called the new Atlantis, uh, and interactive dash the letter u dot com. Interactive u dot com is the uh, educational website, and that's it. All righty. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful, and you know I I urge these listeners to go on and check your site out, um, and check out the pyramid code. Um, I found it very very, you know, interesting, and and you can learn a lot about it. And, you know, I also encourage people maybe to look at your courses because, you know, for a new way to, of learning and stuff, I think that's amazing. And I think you're wonderful in, in what you're doing. And I just want to thank you so much for taking your time to come here and, and you know, talk with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. That was an amazing interview, guys. Um... You know, she's right. We have to, she's very right in, in the way she thinks. We have to uh, realize that, you know, when we're out there and, and we shouldn't be having to spend all, the, all this money on taxes and groceries and, you know, we need to get back to free energy and, and you know, we're stopped. We're stopped by our government. We're stopped by all the people, you know, that, that want their paycheck, they want their, their pockets lined, but what about us that are struggling to even have enough to eat? Um, it's, it's absolutely true. 
Um, well, that's all we have time for today. And we post our shows on YouTube. And if you want to know more about our guests and upcoming shows, please visit our Info to Rail webpage. Just Google Info to Rail and click on our Google Sites page. Um, from there, you can get to our YouTube or you can just Google Info to Rail and go to our YouTube site. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here at Info to Rail. Uh, the guests and the listeners are what makes this possible. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate each and every one of you. And we hope to see you here each and every week. Um, may God bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon. <laughs>